Good afternoon, everybody. That was a very generous introduction. Thank you. I'll start with that hand dryer. Okay, I've got it up here. On the, you've all used one of these, haven't you? The Dyson Airblade. What we actually said about it, you almost got it right. We actually said it was the first electrical hand dryer that actually dries your hands. Now, that's, that's pretty good cut through. I think a lot of what Steve was alluding to was about really focusing on the needs of the user or the customer, making your product or your service, your great products, fit that. And that's how you stand out. I start with this because I wanted to just emphasize that normally, if you, if you actually come up with a great idea, like a vacuum cleaner without a bag, and you clean up with that, no joke intended, that's great. But it's normally said you, you won't come up with another one. And the whole essence of Dyson was to say, no, 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 that's, that's rubbish. We, we will keep coming up with other ones. So then along comes the electrical hand dryer that actually dries your hands. And then, of course, the air multiplier. Have you all seen this? The cooling fan that doesn't have blades. So there is something very, very important about distinctiveness, standing out. So if you think about the customer, that maybe translates to us as suppliers of services and products to wanting to do something different, to be different. And that's about living an ideal, living a dream. It goes through everything that you do. Like when Dyson advertised, for example, it, it, it actually mimicked the way that prestige cars were advertised. So you know prestige cars were advertised in brochures coming out of black space. Well, prior to Dyson's arrival, vacuum cleaners were shot in home situations, usually with women using them, right? So we, we took all that away, ripped it up, chucked it out, and focused on the technology. So I'd like to just study a little bit with you, if I may. Um, the, the whole source of inventiveness in creating that difference has got to be about ideas. The number of times I get asked about, well, how did you go about fostering this culture of constant invention? Because if you think it's about just recruit a pile of engineers and lock them in a room for days at a time, you're wrong. It isn't about that. People make an enormous difference. Of course they do. We tended to hire our straight from university, top graduates. James used to say, uh, I want them to make their first mistakes here. As a CEO, I thought, yeah, great. Yeah, but that's exactly the approach that we had. I, I've, I'd like to give you an example, though, that I think epitomizes idea creation. Uh, because very often companies say, you know, we'd really love to foster a, a more creative spirit. We'd like to encourage more ideas. Why don't we seem to be able to do that? Very often the answer lies in the way that they go about running their business. That the, it's all about rules and regulations and meetings and timescales and everybody's got 125% workload and there's no time to think. So if you, if you have that, if that's the DNA of your business, then the chances are that you hoping that your company will become really creative is going to remain as a hope. It won't become a reality. You have to foster creative spirit and really mean it. You've got to liberate the environment so that ideas are created. Dyson aren't the only company who've achieved this, but they're a good example. So there was one day, I can remember, when a top engineer at Dyson rang my office and said he'd got something to show me in the lab. When I got an invitation like that, I always went straight to the lab because it was like one of those James Bond Q moments. I was bound to see something marvelous and inventive. Not on this particular day. When I went down to the lab, I was greeted by about 30 or 40 very young people, the engineers who'd worked on Air Multiplier, which had already been launched. They weren't showing me a new product. This is what they were showing me. <laughs> they had rigged up. <laughs> uh, I think there was about 120 of these Air Multipliers stacked on boxes, uh, strapped onto rafters, nailed onto the wall, and they'd popped a balloon in the first one, and they were showing me, look at this, you pop a balloon in the first one, and it goes all the way around on its own. That's fantastic, because of course the air multiplier induces and entrains air. That's how it operates. I, I, sometimes I confess I can be a bit obtuse. My first thought was, no wonder their bloody projects aren't on time. <laughs> that was my first thought. But then afterwards, I thought, no, hold on. Doesn't this just epitomize 
the, the unleashing of creativity, the fact that all these young people could actually come up with that idea and thought it was a good idea to do it, says something about the relationship that they had with their managers, their directors, and their leaders. So that was a good, very good example. By the way, the, the, the marketing team uh, took complete ownership of this, said it was their idea, and put, put it up on YouTube, and it achieved hundreds of thousands of hits. You probably all know the Dyson story, but it's all about one of hard graft originally, a breakthrough moment, prototype, and then pretty rapid expansion I met James in 96, as you quite rightly said, David. He looked at me to come in and help him take it global. He had one product, the DCO1, one market, the UK, that was it. Revenue, about 50 million, now it's over a billion. He was making money, about four or five million quid, not much. Now he makes about 330 million EBIT. Rapid expansion, really quick actually, really, really quick, which carries with it its own dangers very exciting. In fact, if you look at the, the tracer graph uh, on how the figures went, this isn't a big facts and figures presentation, but it's not bad. You know, you'd like that shape. You'd like that shape forever. Uh, and having just released their results for 2012, they're up to about 1.2, 1.3 billion. Just as I was leaving, James, the last year I was there, we brought the one billion pound mark, par captured perfectly by the sun, one billion success, wonder who thought of that one. <laughs> but of course, if you are flying, I often sort of say this to people, that if you're, if you're flying and you're having impact in your industry sector, it generally means that you're eating somebody else's lunch, doesn't it? Because if, you, if you're taking share out of a market, then that's good for you, but it's probably not brilliant for somebody else or for a few other people. And there were all sorts of funny things that went on because that vacuum cleaner market, you know, that's like a big market. That's a six billion vacuum cleaners sold, billions and billions of dollars worldwide. So there was quite a staunch reaction when Dyson started having an impact. Anybody remember, uh, for the UK people here, anybody remember the money program? Compulsory Sunday evening viewing. So in 1995, just before I met James, he was asked if he would participate in one of their little sessions uh, on the money program. The, the money program production team had caught on to the fact that there was a bit of a vacuum cleaner war going on. So they invited him on, and they invited Hoover on, and they invited Electrolux. Just watch this little video, and, and just as you're doing so, just ask yourself the question, if I was watching this in 1995, who would I put money on? I haven't got time to put it to the vote, but I could guess at the answer. I'm going to just lift another piece of this because you, the guy who, from Hoover, uh, his name is Mike Rutter, he said something that was just so spectacular, it's run and run and run for years. Because this is, by the way, if any of you ever get into media spokesperson mode, this is precisely the kind of thing that you do not say. He'd just been asked a question, and the question was, hey, you guys had the chance to take the Dyson invention, didn't you? Because James had offered it to you. James originally wasn't going to do it himself. He'd offered it and said, do you want to do this under license? And you turned it down. Do you regret that decision? This was his answer. I do regret that Google as a company did not take the product technology off the shelf, take it off Dyson, and it would have lain on the shelf and not have been used. <laughs> I do regret that Google as a company did not take the product <laughs> I think you probably got that. Yeah, now that would be a spectacular bad. But does anybody know him? I, can't, I keep thinking one of these days I'm going to bump into him. He apparently is from Cardiff, and they were putting up a new motorway about the time of this, and he's disappeared. I don't know if <laughs> we connect these. But he did, he did. He left straight afterwards. 
I think the, the, the key point here is that when you, when you are posing a threat, you will get this. You might get it in a soft way, you might get it in a very aggressive way. And Dyson is all about invention, and therefore it's about protecting its invention with patents. To put those patents on the wall, so to speak, requires millions of outlay on people, inventions, and protecting with IP. So if somebody takes you to test, so Hoover again, like Hoover did in 98, they brought a product called the Hoover Vortex. It only breached four of Dyson's technology patents. Then, of course, you go for them, don't you? You have to, otherwise there's no point in protecting your invention. So we took them to the high court and we won. The best example, though, of competitors losing their heads, I think, is the one I'm going to show you next. So you need, you need to sort of think about this in the context of if you're having an impact and your competitors start to react to you, Maybe sometimes you are the competitor, you're the one thinking about reacting, so think of it both ways. It's really, really careful that you keep a cool head. Uh, James is really a big risk taker, and I think that's also part, isn't it, of innovation, invention, doing something different. You've got to be prepared to take a few risks. I was rolling Dyson out across Europe. I think there are some people from Belgium here today, are there? Show of hands, anybody from Belgium? Yeah, I can see one or two. This relates to your country. Um, do you remember back in 97, 98, Belgium, comparative advertising was banned. It was not allowed. Now, the only kind of advertising that we did was comparative. So, so I went to James and I said to him, um, thinking about running this ad in Belgium, we're probably not going to be able to run this ad. The ad, by the way, was bags kill suction. Here's why. Pretty in your face. All the other vacuum cleaners in, in Belgium at the time were bagged vacuum cleaners. So he said, well, what's the worst thing that can happen? I said, well, the worst thing that can happen is that a competitor will take us to court, win an injunction without any doubt, and we'll have to take the ad down. So he said, let's just do it. It was a small campaign. We were only spending 250,000 euros. Uh, were we right? Did somebody take us on? I'll show you in a moment. Not just one. Six multinationals went for a joint injunction, okay? And they won, of course. And just before I show you that, that my marketing team, this is something also about keeping your head, that can feel like really bad news because the court said, take the ad down. By the way, we notice your boxes, your literature, your website, it's got offensive images all over it. You've got to take all that out and you've got 30 days to do it. You can imagine. Very small marketing team based back in the UK. They're like, oh my God, what are we going to do about this? Well, we sat down with them, and uh, a big theme at Dyson that we promoted was try to turn adversity to opportunity. So the first thing we did was we went off to all the broadcast media in Belgium, all the, all the press, and we told them about this, and they carried it. They thought it was great because nobody knew the, who the hell Dyson were, and the fact we'd been flattened by these six big guys was good news. But we also ran a campaign called the Blacked Out Campaign, where we ran pretty much the same ads, but anything we weren't allowed to say, we just blacked out. Anything in the boxes, we just blacked out. The website was blacked out. Complete nonsense. And James scrawled a message at the bottom of these ads saying, well, I'm really sorry I can't tell you about my technology, but my competitors have taken me to court and I can't tell you. Sorry. And the press loved that too. So here they are. Here's the, I called them the clogging six. Here we go. And here's the blacked out ad, James's message down in the bottom. You won't be able to read it, but you get the idea, right? So that's how, I guess, we were able to turn adversity to opportunity. And Belgium became a great market for us. And by the beginning of 99, we were right up there in the top three. And shortly after, we became number one. But I really do believe we were helped by our six competitors. OK. So if you are flying and it's all going really well, uh, the bumps in the road don't just come courtesy of your competitors. Our chancellor at the time, Gordon Brown, that was when he was happy, I think. <laughs> I think that was when he was happy. That was, that was before Jeremy Clarkson described him as the one-eyed Scottish idiot. Uh, and, 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 and then I think he withdrew the one-eyed, didn't he? Yeah. Um, Gordon Brown came to open our new technology center and we said, look, Gordon, we've got plans to expand. Things are going really well here in Malmesbury in the UK. Uh, but the, the local press in 
Uh, the local government and officials didn't like the idea. They railed against this idea, thought we were big enough and polluting the local environment, working 24 hours, seven days a week. So we weren't really expecting this challenge to come. We decided, therefore, to pick our bags up and move down to Asia so that we could expand freely without that kind of political problem. The press, of course, just shifted the attack. Now they were attacking us for selling Britain down the river and so on. But we weren't taking it uh, down to like sweatshops in China. We were going into bright, airy factories in Malaysia and Singapore. We were able to develop testing facilities like we'd never dreamt of. Quality, I know, is very important to this company. So it was very, very important to Dyson. You sell a product at the top, premium-wise, you've got to make sure that it's good quality. We even uh, developed a human testing center where we had <laughs> Malaysian workers, and their job was to destroy the product, seek and destroy. And as you'll see, and by the way, there was an engineering influence here, because at the point where something broke, that was logged and it was fed back up in a data collection system, so the engineers could see whether they were getting closer to the Six Sigma type goals. It was a very, very sort of destructive fact. She's going to break this. <laughs> She's definitely going <laughs> to... In fact, testing was so important that one of the best advertisements that Dyson ran in the UK, it was one of our very bright young marketers came to me and he said, do you know what? We hero technology. We're all about out-investing our, our competitors in product design, and we should get that across. We should get that across. And he had this idea that the ad should just feature, it should just hero our commitment to technology and design. Some of you might have seen this. It's one of my favorite ads, I have to say, and not a word was spoken. No words, no claims, nothing. Researched brilliantly. Such was the commitment to testing. I'm going to flick over to America now, if I may, because if you're asking questions like, well, how do you develop ideas and cut through in a market which is like the most developed consumer market in the world, the hardest to penetrate, for Brits here today, America is often described as a graveyard for British businesses, or a great old American expression, you don't get a second chance to make a first impression. Right? It's, that, it's got that kind of stigma about it. So as we go in, the amazing thing is that we had had uh, a, a product that we manufactured under license. We didn't do it. We gave them the manufacturing license. That's the one on the left. This is the one we went in with. The reason why we went in at all is because the one on the left lost their way. We'd been saying to them, you need to you know, talk more about your technology. You need to not talk about filtration, but talk about it never loses suction. You need to make it look bright and jolly. But they said, no, 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 you don't understand America. People have got allergies, that's what they're interested in. All vacuum cleaners look like this. This is how we have to be. So eventually, our competitors in America were able to come out with bright, no-bag vacuum cleaners, and they killed these guys. But for some reason, our competitors allowed us to go into the court in Toronto where these guys were in administration and purchase our rights back for America because Dyson were locked out. So thus, in 2001, we were able to launch at the Terence Conran shop in New York. And the reaction to our product was amazing. And the reason why I think was because we thought very, very carefully about how were we going to talk to the actual shopper the user of the vacuum, we put a lot of thought into that. So it wasn't just about advertising, it was a lot of it was about getting our communications right. Just a few samples of uh, coverage. But the reaction on the Ellen show, does anybody know the Ellen show in America? It's a big prime time show, goes out uh, several times a week, was stunning. This was it.
<laughs> Are there any Americans here? <laughs> Sorry. But my goodness, fantastic reaction. Now, what, what did our competitors do? They already knew our DNA, they knew our track record, and now we were in the biggest market in the world. What do you think they did, right? Well, of course, unlike Belgium, anything goes in America. My vacuum makes me look good. My vacuum is in a fashion magazine. My vacuum wins hot and it cleans better than Dyson. The self-propelled wind up by Hoover cleans carpet 56% better than Dyson. It's proven by the only recognized test representing real life conditions in American homes. After all, do you want people to look at your vacuum? Or your clean home? We found technology by Hoover. Clean to the highest power. Now I've got to say that by this time, the Dyson marketing team were beginning to mature in the way they thought. At the beginning of our campaigns, they would have thought, oh my God, this is terrible because Hoover was spending millions of dollars airing this ad all around America. But because they'd learned from some of the twists and turns in the UK and across Europe, they realized this is very good news. <clears throat> now just before this ad was run, Dyson had only been going about 14 months in the US. <clears throat> Spontaneous awareness was rubbish. And even the prompted awareness was sort of like low 20s. After this ad, both rocketed, right? And within two years from launch, Dyson took brand leadership from Hoover. It almost feels like this is made up because as intelligent people, you, you wouldn't really expect mistakes like this to be made. This is what happens when organizations panic. Anyway, I think the funniest one in America had to be a company that, if there are Americans here, you'll know them. They're called Shark. And what they do is they steal other people's ideas, copy them like crazy, unashamedly, watch that they don't uh, infringe copyright or design rights or patents, and then sell the product for half the price, but making big claims that it's as good as the one they're copying. Right? So they went one step further than anybody else had done. Not only did they do all that copying, but they also ripped off James Dyson. This is a legendary Dyson vacuum. This is the Shark Navigator. My vacuum has no loss of suction technology. Mine too! In the middle of that, there's deep clean carpets. Same lab test and deep cleaning. But my vacuum is lightweight. Just as light. Mine comes with a five year warranty. Mine too! Look, anyone who shops on mine knows that Dyson gets four and five star rating. But so does the Navigator. And best of all, my vacuum costs half as much as yours. Isn't that great? Uh, Incredible. Incredible. James wasn't very happy with this one. <laughs> he said, that's not like me. No, of course I didn't, James. Um, <laughs> my lawyer, my le head of legal counsel, was very calm. He said, this is not a problem. I'll have that ad down within 48 hours because that is a breach of James Dyson's image rights. You know, like footballers and celebrities have image rights. James Dyson has image rights. It's part of his goodwill balance sheet, etc. The ad was pulled, as Martin predicted, uh, within 48 hours. But within three weeks, they'd replaced the ad with one that did not infringe James Dyson's image rights. Would you like to see it? So I've got to give them the prize for cheek. Right, <laughs> I've got to give them the prize for cheek. So, that, that, but that determination, single focus determination to be different, to keep inventing, doesn't matter what your competition throw at you, do not let them deflect you from where you're going. Take risks. That won through wherever we went. And I think Japan's a really good example because we were warned off going to Japan. Because uh, anybody who knows Japan, visits Japan, anybody? You know that consumer electronic companies are giants. I mean, they're world beaters. So it was kind of a, well, nobody ever makes money in Japan with electrical products unless it's got a Japanese name on it. But everything we were looking at said, yeah, but Japan is the home of technology, of innovation. And surely that must ride higher than uh, just you know, wanting to be loyal to Japanese brands and so on and so forth. 
So when we backed that hunch, we went into Japan. Last year, Japan was the second most profitable market in the world for Dyson. Phenomenal success. It was just a little compilation of uh, Japan media reaction to Dyson. <laughs> This had never really been done before, like uh, a domestic appliance uh, just, just setting the Japanese nation alight as it had done. Now I put this one up because this of course is a Dyson washing machine. Do you remember the Dyson washing machine? Which was taken off sale about three or four years after it went on sale because it didn't make any money. And the reason why I'm putting that up is because it isn't all dream team stuff. Mistakes are made, you get things wrong. And it's really important when you get those things wrong that you square up to it because failures sap the energy of the organization, of the team, and of course they sap finances, so it's really important to get it right. I'm, I'm just gonna draw to a, a, a conclusion now, but it's something I often get asked, and I thought it might be of interest to you, because I often get asked, what's it like working with a founder entrepreneur, James Dyson's caliber, because he's immensely successful. And, and what's it like working with him? Is it easier, isn't it? Well, there was a book written about Dyson by Ian Carruthers. If you don't know him, it's worth looking him up. He's done these short brand stories on people like uh, McDonald's and Starbucks and so on. The deal with this guy is that if you agree that he can do your company, you can't control him. You have to give him complete access to your business, to your executives. And whatever he will write, he will write. Okay? He's not there just to flatter you. So we thought, we're about taking risks. Let him have a go. So in he came and he did this story. He did a little interesting approach, which at the start of each chapter, he had a famous quotation. There's one from Thomas Edison, for example. And then a different chapter, he had one from Winston Churchill. When I'm waiting to see this book, right? I'm waiting to see this book, my comms guy rings me up. And he said, we've got the, uh, we've got the copy of the book. He said, you're going to love it. He says, it's great. He said, they've used a quotation one of your quotations, Martin, and he's laughing. I said, what is it? He said, I'm not going to tell you. Not, you've got to see it. You've got, is it good? Is it bad? Mm, depends which way you look at it. <laughs> he said, but I think you can expect a visit from James. Unfortunately, this was the quote. <laughs> <laughs> so, James Dyson appeared in my office for copying the book, looking very kind of scolding. Did you say that? I tried to explain to him, yes, I had said it, but not in that way. It's quite difficult, that. <laughs> um, when he was interviewing me, uh, he asked me about my early experiences, and I, I just happened to be relaying to him that when I walked around the place during my interview sequence, there were lots of young people around, there was lots of noise. I actually had said to him, it was like Santa's grotto on Christmas Eve, you know? It was just unbelievable, and I think I said, to be honest, it was a bit of a nut house. There you go. Anyway. Um, working with James has been a fantastic experience because he is a brilliant engineer and he's a brilliant entrepreneur. But for those of you who've worked closely with entrepreneurs, a very important thing to understand is that they can be brilliantly right and they can be spectacularly wrong. So your role if you're shadowing them is to make sure that they do more of the former and less of the latter. Um, just to emphasize the importance of taking risks, doing things differently, and making sure that that is your reputation that when people think about your company, that's what they say. Our vision was to be known all around the world. People would see our brand name, they would think, it probably works differently, it probably works better, I'm going to pay twice as much for it. That's what we wanted them to think. So when Kellogg's, the cereal maker, asked us if we would mind featuring one of our products on one of their ads, I think most marketing teams would have told them where to go, because brand integration and all the rest of it. But James and I thought, no, no, it's another risk. It's not going to damage us. This could be fun. Let's do it. This is the act. <laughs> Sorry. Did that run out of time? 
have I pissed you off? <laughs> Actually, the end. <laughs>